All right, we are now live. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 127, the show that you've been uh, waiting for, all you Polonia pals. Uh, tonight, we're going to have the man himself, Mark, and my co-host, as always, Echo. How are you? Pretty good. So it's the big show tonight. Uh, yeah, 127. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hard to believe. So <laughs> triple digits there. So... Yep. So, been looking forward to this. How's your week been? Oh, busy, busy, busy. Mm -hmm. We so had those, good. yeah, we had those fires in Washington State, and I live in the part of the state where all the smoke collects. Okay, we got uh, Darius in here tonight. Welcome. How are you? Uh, we got Sheriff Cowley fan 01. That was, yeah, that was from earlier today. I guess they had left the comment, so maybe they'll be back in. And I see there's someone on Facebook, too, uh, left a like. So uh, we are dual streaming. If you're watching on Facebook and want your comments to be seen, uh, just go ahead and approve them. All right. And uh, let's see. I'm going to go ahead. Um, yeah. Facebook user. Hello, whoever you are there. <laughs> um, thanks for joining. And uh, here is our guest. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on the show, and thank you for everyone who's uh, going to watch. All right. We appreciate it. We've been a uh, long time coming for this one, so appreciate it there. Let's see. Oh, let's see. Darius says hello. I'll bring up uh, any comments across the screen there for you. So uh, welcome. How's your, your week been? Uh, busy as usual. It's never a dull moment in Polonia land, as you well know. Ah, uh, yes. Working working on uh, various projects and uh, kind of tying up some loose ends on the stocking. So, ah, uh, yes. Looking forward to that one. Had a good time working on that. Everybody did a great job. That was uh, probably the most fun I've had in a long time acting. So, I'm glad that I was a part of it. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it's seeing funny. it. It's funny. It's funny. Everyone, everyone said how much fun they had on the set, and Jeff and I jokingly joke to each other and say, "God, I don't remember having that much fun." <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> well, no, when when you're you know when you're running the show, you're you're busy doing a million things, so you know you don't have time to sit and chat and joke around. You're busy, you know, getting through the day, solving problems, you know. Setting up lights, equipment, blocking stuff. So it's all kind of a big blur to me. But I had a great time. Don't get me wrong. But Oh, of course. Yeah. Got to also be busy putting together, you know, lots of hard work doing that. So, I mean, I understand completely. Everyone, everyone gets to play and have fun, but you have to be the one who does all the work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the, the director... The director, the, 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 the rule is the director gets no credit, but all the blame. Mm. Well, that's good to know. If it, anything goes wrong, it, we'll just blame you. So. Right, <laughs> yeah, so right, right. I always go with the old theory. Always blame somebody who's not around. That has nothing to do with it, so they can't defend themselves. That's what we do. <laughs> so... Um, my first question for you, um, where was it that you grew up and when um, you did movies with your brother, um, whose idea was it to start it? What got you into filmmaking? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our interest in filmmaking started when we were probably five or six and it was a rainy Saturday. We couldn't go outside. It was probably, I don't know, spring maybe. And, um, we turned on the TV, but, you know, back then you got like three channels and maybe a pirate UF, UHF channel, if you were lucky. And uh, Godzilla vs. The Thing was on, which is Godzilla vs. Mothra. And, and I remember watching that and being somewhat scared, um, but also absolutely fascinated with, with it. Like, how did they do this? What, what is this? You know, I... How do you make movies like this? So that kind of started our journey to filmmaking. Um, we had seen movies before that, but that just seems to be the one that had the real impact. And at a very early age. So, you know, from that point on, we would write scripts. We had to go to the library and sign out books on filmmaking. There were, there were very few. 
we were fortunate enough to buy one at a Walden Books, you know, a store that doesn't exist anymore. That and eventually, story. eventually, we we bought our own uh, Super 8 camera. So we started, you know, shooting shooting these things that we would write. But it, it was it was kind of a process, um, you know. One thing led to another, to another, and it's it's really been a lifelong, a lifelong passion. I mean, they say don't put all your eggs in one basket, but but we did, and um, it was worth it. It was worth it. I didn't go outside and play football with the neighborhood kids. I wrote scripts, and we we made special effects, and really just immersed immersed ourselves in in the whole process, and eventually. You know, we made our first feature film right out of high school, and uh, it got distributed all across the United States. And that was nineteen, that was nineteen eighty seven, and have been in constant production ever since. So, you know, in the interim, I was fortunate enough to get a job at a production house. So, I never went to college or had any formal training, but that really was my training ground between making the movies and working at a production house where you had better equipment and, and tools that you didn't necessarily have, but we were able to use on our own productions. And then eventually I left that job and got the job at Commonwealth University at Mansfield where I originally ran a media department and then moved into marketing. So my whole life's been really wrapped up in, in a creative endeavor creative aspects and and i'm fortunate because i wake up every day and i do what i love to do and a lot of people you know unfortunately can't say that but and um so since you all did your own effects and everything as you progressed through your shorts and films and everything um what was the most challenging for the practical effects and as you learned you know, honestly, the, the, the challenge was is, is, was finding supplies. I mean, you had to order latex. We had to learn how to make our own fake blood. We had to learn how to make molds. You know, all this stuff wasn't readily available. We had to either order it and wait forever or, or somehow find it and figure out how to make do with what we had. You know... It, when you're doing makeup effects and things like that, what, what you see to the eye doesn't always translate to what is captured on film or video. It can look better. It can look worse. And a lot of it's how you light it. And those are things that we learned. You know, A lot of our early films were just uh, set pieces for special effects. But, but eventually we, we you know, got into storytelling and using those effects in an appropriate manner to help tell the story. So it's a very multi-layered sort of a process, but it was always fun. I mean, it was challenging because, you know, even today our resources are very limited, but, you know, that's kind of the fun part. It's, it's how do we figure this stuff out with what you have? You know, if here's the thing. Anyone in the world could make a movie if they were given $150 million. Anyone could. Your grandmother could. Because all you would do is hire all the best people that you, you could afford. You know, when you're making a movie for less than ten, five, four thousand dollars $4,000, you can't throw money at problems. You've got to be resourceful. You've got to be creative. And it really does you know, stimulate your imagination and problem solving skills. So, you know, anyone can make a movie for $150 million. Not many can make one for less than five. So you really learn to work with what you have and, and do the best, the, do the best job you can. And it's a skill that, you know, eventually you, you overcome and, you know, nothing's really that difficult. Um, what, um, advice would you give for people trying to get into a look at, um, any specific source or good ways to household items for effects or anything like that? Well, gosh, you know, one, <laughs> one time we had to do a, a slit throat and, um, you know, we didn't have any latex. So 
my brothers, he, he went and grabbed some toilet paper and threw it in, in this bowl of caro syrup and pulled it out and put it on the person's neck. And I'll, I swear to God, it looked like a prosthetic. I was just totally amazed. Um, you know, we did, we were doing stuff like that all the time. You know, doing forced perspective where you put something in front of the camera to make it look like it's giant, and yeah. put your put the people in the background and and uh, you know all kind of shooting up and having someone jump out of frame and then land on a car and all kinds of crazies. We we did all kinds of crazy stuff, but it was exciting and we were learning and. And the interesting thing is, is that, you know, not just in filmmaking, anything in life, guys, no matter what you're doing, sometimes you can be your own worst enemy. You, you can convince yourself you can't do something, so you just don't do it. But in, you know, in my mind, and people ask me this when I go to conventions and seminars and stuff, they say, well, what, what made you think you could ever make a movie in the first place? And and my answer is, is it, it never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. So that barrier was immediately gone. Um, you know, I know people who say, I'm going to you know, make a movie when I get this, 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 and this. And chances are they're never going to make a movie. They're just talking themselves out of it. But, you know, you just, you just, you go for it. You don't always succeed. No movie's a failure. I mean, any movie that you start and finish you deserve credit because there's a lot of people that start movies and never finish them despite your budget. So it, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. Filmmaking at our level is a lot of work because you're, you're, you know, few people are running the show. They're, they're getting the locations, they're catering, they're, they're setting up lights They're running the camera. They're driving the cast and crew to the bathroom you know, you do you you wear so many hats, but the the good thing about that is is that you know in my position, because of my background, my training, and all the films I've made, I know what it takes to put a movie together from A to Z. I I, I have the blueprint right here in my head. It doesn't change much. Um, you know, if you go into a trade, you do one thing. You might be in charge of assisting the the guy setting up lights you might be in charge of electric and you know you see the process but you're not involved in it and um it's it's great to really look at a script and go okay i know how i'm going to put this together i need this 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 and this we have to shoot this this day because of this and that and you really you really learn the process and once you understand the process it's half the battle because it prepares you for anything that comes your way that may not be planned. Bad weather, an actor yeah. doesn't show up, um, you know, all these things you can't control because you can't control the weather. People get sick and they can't make it. And sometimes things don't work out and, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta be resourceful, but the more you do this, the more that comes second nature, the more it comes naturally i've made 101 films as as we speak so you know you really you really get to know the whole thing from concept to completion and that's that's a real filmmaker you know to understand something from ground zero to delivering to a distributor um when it comes to a uh, su subgenre, um, do you prefer like slashers, uh, sci-fi, any uh, sharks or any particular? Oh, we know you love your shark movies, but uh, do you have a favorite? You know, I've made movies pretty much across the board. I, I've done a Western. I've done a kid's movie. I, I've never done a drama. I have no interest in that. And I think I gravitate towards sci-fi horror fantasy because it's 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 a plateau where you can be creative um for me it's just such a wide plateau for you to explore ideas and be creative in those genres versus you know a straight drama or you know even action per se but 
that's just where my interests lie because those are the kind of movies I liked as a kid. So, uh, you know, that sort of that sort of seeded in you, whether you, you're aware of it or not. You really are a product of of what what you saw, what you were exposed to. And I was fortunate. Uh, my brother and I were fortunate because when we grew up, TV. You know, obviously there were matinees. We went to the movies a lot. We saw tons of movies, but television was really burgeoning and you could turn on you know on saturday you could watch six or seven different horror science fiction movies and then at night they'd play a couple um even on sunday this one station would play japanese monster movies it was great and then hbo came around now it, people take that for granted today but i remember when it first hit the hit the cable uh, market our neighbor got it and it bled into our cable so we were able to watch all like Food of the Gods and Airport 75 and and Roller Coaster and all these movies we never would have had access to otherwise right there. So it was a really big pool of, of different types of films that that we kind of swam in, that we dove into and and there's I still like them to this day. And, and I think that's why you know, I choose to stay in the genre that I do. Oh, um, what inspires you when you write a script? And do you have like a, a specific process? Like maybe think of just the title first or write the ending and go back? Or how do you uh, process that? I'm pretty methodical. Um, I have a friend, Brett Piper, and he, he writes a script with, without a title. And I'm like, I cannot write a script unless I have a title. That's what you hang your hat on. And uh, what I take into account when I write a script often is budget, locations, cast, um, you know, the idea, the idea sort of inspires the story, but you do have to be mindful of your resources. So, you know, that's usually where I start. That's not to say I'm going to always make a movie that's, you know, easy to do because we've done science fiction movies we've done shark movies all these things are rather complicated but but you don't grow as a filmmaker if you don't stretch yourself you know you don't want to be making the same movie over and over and over again and in the 101 films i've made i don't think any two are alike so are some better than others of course um but you know, when you when you just reach beyond what you know you're capable of, that's when you grow. And I think every filmmaker should do that every time they make a new movie. Okay, let's challenge ourselves in a little different way here and see how see how it works out. And if it doesn't, you've learned something and you can reapply that later. So, uh -huh. and this, uh, is a, this is being educational, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I find it fascinating. <laughs> Educational, fun, yes, it is. Um, you were recently on the Shutter Shark uh, Shark Quotation special that they did on there. Um, what do you think uh, lately? Why everybody gravitates towards sharks? Uh, wh what do you think is the appeal? You know, honestly, I, I I think it's it's a it's a fad. It's like zombie movies, slasher movies. They come and go. Shark films seem to have stuck around for a while, and I think, I don't know, there's a mystery to sharks, you know, they're, they're prehistoric, they're one of the few animals that survived whatever cataclysmic event destroyed most of life on the planet. Um, so, I think people are just fascinated with sharks, I'm not like overly fascinated, I wanted to see Jaws when I was a kid, but... My older sister went and saw it before I did, and she came home and told my mother it was about a giant shark that eats naked ladies, so I wasn't allowed to go see it. But I did see Jaws 2 when it came out, and I really liked it. And and I think, you know, Sharknado is probably the movie that, that sort of created this resurgence in, in sharks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah because um, before, before then we had, like... Uh... Deep Blue Sea, uh, the uh, Mega Shark movies, and they were much different than what Mega, what a uh, Shark NATO was. Then yeah. you started getting more like the ridiculousness, uh, Ice Shark and Go Shark and all this, you know, 
puppets, doll shark, all of this stuff just yeah. exploded. <laughs> By the way, just did the tenth anniversary of Sharknado, which I think they said they they did something with the effects and added some stuff, which makes me want to see this tenth anniversary now to see what they did. Yeah, I'm curious to see. I, that. Uh, when I was in LA, I went to the Asylum Studios to to talk to the people there. I, I couldn't even get past the secretary, but in any event, they had the big uh, one of their big shark head props hanging on the wall. It was pretty cool. I know it's the one they used in probably one or two or three of their movies, but yeah, I mean, shark movies, at least the ones I make are campy and fun because that's, that's, that's all we can really do with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're never going to replicate what Jaws brought to the screen. I'm shocked they haven't remade that movie yet. And I hope they never do because they'll I never they make it any better. No, that's one movie. I hope they don't remake. I mean, they're running out of ideas and remaking stuff that shouldn't be remade. So it, it's either remakes or adaptions of like something like Train to Busan. Let's make an American adaption, <laughs> which is a movie people are already getting the pitchforks and stuff ready yeah. for. When that's Train to New York, they got it all ready. Mm. <laughs> well, when they did uh, Death Note, or was it Death Note? Yeah, I think it was Death Note. And uh, oh, what's his name? Who was in the first spot? Um, William Defoe. Uh, yeah, he voiced that the character. Was horrible. Yeah. Oh, they were already judging that. What? You're changing the nationality of the characters? Yeah. Oh, Lord. But the story wasn't even that good, in my opinion. I mean, if they at least would have made it a little bit like it, I don't know. Well, then all, if you're going to watch those movies, there's uh, three or four that were made in Japan mm. that are a lot better. Yeah. Then that was Netflix. Yeah. yeah, I don't go for Netflix really anymore. There's nothing good on there. Um, so uh, recently, yeah, Mark, you were just telling me, unfortunately, as we all know, the Kia has been in many movies. It should have its own internet movie database page. So uh, it finally kicked the bucket, huh? <laughs> I heard. Yeah, the the Kia, the stalking is the last movie the Kia will ever appear in. It would, uh, it broke a timing belt on the way to work. It's been acting kind of weird lately, but the timing broke belt. The timing belt broke and ruined ruined the engine, and uh, it would have cost more to fix it than it than it was worth. I've had that car for ten or eleven years. It's been paid off forever. So I, I knew one of these days it was gonna go and I, I told my wife she, she, after it was paid off, she's like, You should go buy a new car. I'm like, no, I don't I'm gonna drive this till it literally dies. And I did. Mm -hmm. I mean I got every penny out of that car and uh I, I you know sold it and uh someone's fixing it so it may be on the road. But I, I bought a little uh it's even smaller, believe it or not. It's it's a, oh, wow. a spark, and it looks. It, I call it marshmallow oh, because it's, yeah, it's, it's a weirdish off white color. And so you'll see that in a thousand movies, I think. But <laughs> the Kia like was the, in. Yeah, so the Kia was like that car that used to always be in what's his name's movie. Um, the Evil Dead guy. Um, used to have that car that used to be in all of his movies. Sam Raim, I had that yellow, yeah, whatever. I can't remember the brand, but yeah, that was kind of his even, trade. It even, yeah, it even showed up in the remake. Sitting there, if you watch it, she's sitting on this old car, if you look at it, oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, I guess Darius might be heading out. I guess that's what he means. So have a good night. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, yeah, the stalking. I'm so glad I got to see it. Uh, that was like one of my main goals to see the Kia. But uh, yeah, I, I never, I never had a chance to ask you, Stephen. What, what did, you, what did you think about your time on the set? I mean, we talked, but we didn't have a chance to talk a whole lot. Um, I really enjoyed it. You know, get to see the process of everything being made. Um, as I've mentioned before, I was an extra, never back down. You know, so that was a bigger set, but. Uh, I really enjoyed working with everybody, um, meeting some of the original Pony Pals and the new the new ones that joined us. Uh, a lot of new people in this one, and uh, I enjoyed working with everyone. And uh, it was a learning experience. It was fun. So and I hope to do many more. Good. So good, good. Yeah, I was everybody. Everybody on that show was great, and that you know that that brings up a good point is that 
you know, when you when you make a movie, it's only as good as everybody that touched it. And 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 I mean that in all sincerity because a lot of people, not just me, a lot of people bring their acting talent to the to the set. They bring their their knowledge of locations, they bring food, you know, they bring gear, they help out with ideas. So it, it film is a collaborative effort and that's the way I like to run things. And and uh, you know Every movie I make would be less of what it is if it weren't for the other people involved. And I think everybody that's worked on my films deserves as much credit as I do. So I, I don't want anyone to get the idea this is a one-man show because it's not. Mm. A lot of talented people bring something special to every project that you work on. And, and they, they deserve a shout-out, too. Everybody who worked on it. Uh, I mean, we got a long great, and like even though we just met, we were like, God, we all clicked, and it just in my opinion went smoothly, minus the rainy night. But uh, other than that, it's yeah, it went uh, very well. So. Yeah, Mother Nature, they can't do nothing about her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Waffles is here. Hello, heroic Waffles. <laughs> greatest name, like yeah, Waffles greatest thing. name, just because Waffles. All the greatest. Better than pancakes and French toast, it's waffles. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. What else we got? Uh, you had any other uh, questions, Echo? I'll let you since I've been... Um, uh, actually, they, uh, re you know, they re-released some of you and your brother's older films. Like, um, the one I still got to watch is Death Reel, I believe. Mm -hmm. it's called it. Which Amazon screwed up. I paid for the DVD, and it's a good screw-up. Pay for the DVD. They send you the Blu-ray. So, what was um, it like? What was your brother like? Uh, John was a, was a great guy. You know, he, he was. We were identical twins. So, if you didn't know us too well, you'd have a hard time f telling us apart. We talked alike. Our mannerisms were alike. Our personalities were different. Um, I think John was a little bit more carefree than I was. He didn't let things bother him. When we were on a film, I tended to, to stress a little more than he did. But, you know, his skills were in, in special effects and writing. He wrote a lot of our stuff. And I would be more of the director and the editor. And, and we would often share those responsibilities. But, you know, I, he was a great guy. And, and um, you know, it's unfortunate that he passed away so early because I can't imagine what kind of movies we would have made if he had still been around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have some cousins who are also identical. The, the only way you can tell them apart, one of them smiles less than the others. Than the other. Hell, they, there was some story you had to take a happy test. He, <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he failed a happy test. <laughs> I want to see. Happy. I want to see what's on this happy test, just to see. Like, what is a happy test? I didn't know they had a happy test. <laughs> That's uh, it's in Washington State. Apparently, they do. So, hmm. Uh, I'll have to look that up. How could you we, fail that though? Just but yeah, yeah. <laughs> do kittens um, bring you joy? No. <laughs> we have in uh in the chat. We have a uh, Chadwick Whitmore, who like you is a um. A filmmaker, Maker, yeah, super awesome guy. He just had uh, the release of his film Malcolm, and he's actually it's great getting to talk to some of your film, you know, the filmmakers because you get to learn, you know, different things. And with you, you very seem very knowledgeable. It's interesting to hear what you, you know you're talking about it in the process of doing the films and stuff. I find it very intriguing. Like I said, it's educational learning. Yeah, you know, I, I like to share my knowledge with people because, you know, when we were making movies, we didn't have a teacher. We, 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 you know, went to the school of hard knocks. We figured it out, but often at the cost of time and money. But, I, you know, I think filmmakers should support one another and uh, help each other out as much as they can. We're all in the same boat, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I've learned... I've learned stuff from other filmmakers, and I'm sure filmmakers learn stuff from me. But if you don't share it, no one's going to know, you know. 
we had a guy once he wanted to do underwater stuff he said i can't i can't do underwater stuff i don't have an underwater camera and we'd already solved that problem i said yeah go go to a, go to a thrift shop and buy a fish tank and put your camera in the fish tank push the lens right up against the glass make sure it's clean push the fish tank underwater below the lens now you have an underwater camera housing we use that we use that all the time now you can go buy you know a gopro and, and do it but back then you couldn't yeah but that's how we that's how we figured out how to do it you know why not put it in a fish tank and push it it looks stupid people watching us are like what the hell are these guys doing you know but but we were put you know you don't want to push it down too far and if you're in the ocean you got to be real careful but if you're in a pool or in a pond it's the best way to get underwater uh, footage without having to spend a fortune on a house buy a were fish any, tank yeah. were there any filmmakers growing up that you were big fans of um you know when we were growing up you, you know i think every filmmaker to a certain age is isolatory you don't really know there's anyone else out there doing that we did subscribe to a magazine called cinemagic and that was really for you know am amateur i don't i hate to use the word amateur but young filmmakers and they always had a producer's bulletin board and and we would write to some of these people and correspond but you know growing up again i watched so many different types of movies and i love them all there, there isn't anything i really would, would hone in on as my favorite filmmaker because i think every filmmaker has stuff i like and then stuff i'm not i don't really care for but um, you know, as a whole, you gotta you know respect Roger Corman. Obviously, that guy is just a bigger version of what all of us do now. Um, you know, George Lucas to a degree, Steven Spielberg, but but then you know you got these little guys that that uh, you know like Ray Dennis Steckler. You know, you gotta admire that guy, Al Adamson. Even people like Andy Milligan, you know, those guys were out there busting their butts, making their vision happen. And despite everything, they did it, you know, even Ed Wood. Look, look at Ed Wood. Who, do you think Ed Wood, you think Ed Wood would have ever guessed they would make a $40 million movie about him? No. <laughs> I mean, they all deserve credit. They really do. Like they got the guy that did Bird Dimmick. He's of that one film. He's had a, a career. Supposedly he's working on a fourth one. Which, oh dear lord. Which which one? The guy who did Bird Dimmick is making a fourth one. Mm. He's the one that turned around and goes, "What was it?" Um, he was talking about Albert Hitchcock, and he was saying there was some film better than Psycho. Um, not yeah. Uh, I think it was that. Uh, one with the guy being chased with the by the airplane in the field. Oh, yeah, yeah. North by Northwest was that yeah. it? Yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> so that was another filmmaker, Albert Chickcock. Yeah, one, his, one of his films. Yeah, I mean, he, he broke every rule with Psycho. Yeah. The studio, the studio wouldn't even let him use their equipment. He had to use his uh, his crew from his Alfred Hitchcock Presents because they didn't even want their hands on it. You know that movie's tame today, but if you look at it, it deals with uh, you know homosexuality. It deals with necrophilia. It it showed two people on a bed without their feet on the floor. It showed a flushing toilet. Yeah, it, it showed a, you know, the guy was dressed in women's clothes. I mean, that movie was like un, untouchable. Universal did not want to have anything to do with that movie. But, you know, look at it, it and it's a class. It was the toilet thing that blew my mind. Like, what? They didn't want you seeing a toilet flushing? <laughs> no, it was, it was against the code. You weren't allowed to do that. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it sounds could, silly yeah, today. Yeah. But. That was at the uh, Hayes Code, was it? You couldn't even show the belly button. Yeah, I'm not sure what. Co I, I, I think it was just an industry standard practice. Um, but you know, anything that was industry standard practice, he threw out the window. You know, the, the like knife in the shower. 
Yeah. Um, what was even some like the TV shows, like say Bewitched, where like the married couple, they how they have like separate beds and stuff. It's like really they they, they never mm -hmm. really had them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they did, you know, that they had that haze code. I think I was reading that King Kong. When it was yeah, they recut they they, they re-edited a lot of movies that were pre-code, like like Actually, uh, King Kong. Uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah freaks all yeah. these movies. Yeah. For years, for years, I didn't know I was seeing the edited King Kong. The mm -hmm. 30, I was 38, and then they're like, oh, we found an uncut one in France. Oh, I got to see this. Hmm. It's, just, it's just little yeah. things like, yeah, when, he, when he's removing the clothes from her, someone being thrown out a window, stuff like that. It's like, oh. So we're talking about um, sort of those types of movies, creatures and stuff. Uh, I want to go ahead and bring up uh, Queen Crab. How is that working with the stop motion? Well, stop motion is a, it's a great process, but it's also very time consuming. Um, with the advent of CGI, stop motion, you know, people thought it was going to be dead, but they still use stop motion for a lot of things because it has a certain look. Stop motion... It, it has a fantasy aspect to it because it, it isn't real. It moves slightly different than reality, but CGI is too perfect. I mean, you go to watch movies like The Hobbit and 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 things like that. It's it's you're watching a video game. Stop motion has a charm and an indelible uh, sense of fantasy that 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 kind of it imbues when you watch it. You know. You know, obviously Ray Harryhausen was the master of it, but you had other people like Phil Tippett, Dave Allen, um, you know, going back farther, Willis O'Brien. You know, they kind of kept the, 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 the process alive. And, and Ray Harryhausen was lucky because he hooked up with a producer that believed in that kind of film. You know, had he not hooked up with Charles Schneer, I think he would have had a real tough time you know, he never would have made the movies he made. That's for sure. But, but the, you know, the guy believed in that process, and 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 at the time, it was the only way to do it. Sometimes I I you know go into classes and I talk to students about animation and stuff, and and uh, you know they all bring up Jurassic Park and and Lord of the Rings, and and you know that's great stuff. You can't knock it. And then you tell them, you know, it took a team of probably 100 people to do all that. And then I show them the scene from Jason and the Argonauts where he, uh, he's fighting the skeletons. Yeah. And I, I said, okay, I want you to watch the sequence. It's, I don't know, a five-minute sequence. And when it's over, I said, guess how many people it took to make that? And, you know, they all, I don't know, 20, 30. I said, one. One person did all that without the aid of a computer, without the aid of an assistant, and it took them four and a half months. You know, that's the difference. And they really, you know, you know, at first they're ready to criticize and laugh at it, but, you know, once you explain the process and the artistic technique behind it, they're a little bit more um, embracing of it because, you know, kids today, they play video games that have... E equal visuals to what you see in the cinema yeah, so there's yeah, no there's that. no yeah there's the, there's the line is so blurred you, you you don't they don't know what they're watching yeah they use that but, motion capture now yeah mm -hmm. which is great i mean i i don't use digital effects per se i do digital compositing because there's a lot of things i do where that's great and there's nothing wrong with digital effects. Don't get me wrong, but I still like the old-fashioned practical effects, and I take stop motion over any CGI monster. I think that one of the things that makes uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas such an enjoyable movie, it is you know stop motion, the whole yeah. thing, and that helps make it a very enjoyable film. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most like people. My age grew up with with you know the 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 Rankin Bass holiday specials. They were all stop motion animation. Um, 
And those things, you know, millions and millions and millions of kids grew up watching. I, they, I, I don't know if they're on TV anymore, but I always looked forward to watching Rudolph and Santa Claus yeah. is coming to town. Not so much because of the story, but because I knew it was stop motion animation. Yeah. It looks so yeah, I knew what that it. process was because we, we did it. We had a camera that could do stop motion and we would build these clay figures and set them on a tabletop we created and click away, click away. And we spent one summer working on a stop motion movie when we were in seventh grade and uh, eighth grade. And uh, it, it was three and a half minutes long. It took us all summer to make it. I don't know where I don't. It's lost now, but it, I can remember bits and pieces of it, and how much fun it was to work on. Uh -huh. um, not really stop motion, but when you um, did the first couple of feeders and came up with the aliens and everything, uh, who came up with the uh, looks for that? Um, those were done by a guy named Bill Morrison out in Ohio. He worked with J.R. Bookwalter. He was kind of his main effects guy. And uh, we, we sent him some rough designs, and he built them. And he built a couple spaceships that we had in the original cut that we cut out and did digital uh, spaceships with a, with a Lightwave 3D when we recut the movie. But Bill Morrison is the one who built them. We built the, we built the ones in part two. And then my son built the feeder puppets in part three. Okay. So, yeah, I know uh, he's keeping in the family business there. When did he start uh, working with you? What was his first movie with you? Uh, he, those kids have been, both of my kids, you know, if, if, if I had to go shoot and my wife was working, I'd just take them to the set with me. And uh, they hang around and help and watch. And, I, you know, my daughter wasn't really that into it, but my son kind of got into it. And he, you know, I bought him a video camera for Christmas one year and he started shooting his own stuff and, and, uh, he'd use my editing system to cut on. And so, you know, it was kind of neat. He was, he was able to sort of step into this without as much headache as my brother and I had, but yeah, both of my kids, they grew up on film sets. Um, you know, and, and, and my daughter, my son loved it. My daughter would complain. And I said, you don't know how lucky you are. I wish when I was a kid, my dad took me to a movie set and I was able to run a production slate or, you know, yeah. do all this cool stuff. <laughs> but she didn't, she didn't care. It was lost on her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he definitely did a good job on the stocking. Once people see that, what he worked on for that, that was really amazing what he worked on there. So. He does. He's, he's, he's very talented and creative and he can, you know, if you gave the kid a vacuum cleaner, he'd turn it into a spaceship. I mean, he just, he has that innate skill. I don't have that. My skills are in other areas, but, you know, he's a lot like John in that respect because he was able to do those kinds of things. And I either couldn't or just didn't have the super desire to do it. Uh -huh. And uh, also I wanted to ask you, um, since Feeders is – dealing with UFOs and aliens. What's your thoughts on UFOs and everything in reality? Do you believe in any of that? Um, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I saw a ghost once, so I'm not going to stand here and say it's all a bunch of BS because it's not. I mean, first you have to determine, yeah, there's some quacks out there that'll see anything, but 90% you know, yeah. of, of Bigfoot, UFO, alien, Loch Ness Monster, paranormal sightings and experiences are from credible people who have everything to lose by admitting to this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the universe is vast. Our world is vast. We understand little about it. And there's things that happen to people, and they experience things that are simply unexplainable. And that's where I leave it. It's unexplainable. I can't, I can't explain what I saw one night in a, in a theater all by myself. I saw something. I don't know what it was. 
I can't explain. It, 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 does, it defies natural explanation. And other people see things too, you know, experience things. And, you know, I, I guess when we die, we'll know the answers to everything. But until then, you got to keep an open mind. I mean, when the U.S. government's starting to admit that this stuff's out there, it's got to make you wonder, you know, they're the last people that would jump on board something like this. But I, I think, I think there's other life out there. Absolutely. I, I it would be sad to think we were the, the uh, penultimate in, in intelligent life forms. I mean, if I was an alien, I looked at this planet, I'd be really disappointed at what I saw most of the time. Yeah, but you, you can even go back as, as far as Egypt, you know, Egyptians had have drawings and, and carvings of people with helmets in ships and things like that. And, you know, these people didn't make this stuff up. They, they drew and they carved what they saw. Yeah. So look at the dragon. There's multiple cultures separated by continents and big two periods of time that all have, you know, like what this Mexico, England. In China or Japan, there's this all these drawings of this mythical flying reptilian creature that just pops up. Yeah, yeah, probably a pterodactyl. I mean, you know, people think, oh, well, there can't be any such thing as a Loch Ness monster. Why the hell can't there be? Alligators are prehistoric. No one looks twice at them. Yeah. Whales, sharks, yeah. certain birds. Lizards, they're prehistoric. I mean, they may not be gigantic, but they've certainly adapted and changed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, don't get me wrong, I'm not some conspiracy theorist at all, but I think this, there is truth to a lot of this. We just may never know the full story. People experience little pieces of it, and, you know, that, that kind of shapes how they think about it, but even as a kid, I used to buy all those books. Like, I don't know, I watched In Search of as a kid on TV, and they had books you could buy about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster, and you know, it was just cool. Again, it's 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 fun to believe that that stuff could exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't get too much into it because I've done paranormal shows in the past and stuff, and I've had my experiences. But what I like, you said how some people just like say random stuff like the crackpots that make it seem like outrageous and the way they tell their stories, people who are serious about it, unfortunately makes might make them look foolish, even though their experiences were true. Like I was watching some UFO uh, show that I got in from the library one time and this woman, and it was so bad. She's just like, I've had telepathic contact for the last year with such, it's just like, really like, you know, it's, just stuff like that that you know well, when, when i saw the the thing i saw this this entity is um it was this tall dark shadow i thought it was a person at first i was down on a stage and there's this big balcony and i saw someone up there and i thought maybe it was a, you know a, a campus officer or the theater the theater uh, professor so i said hi no response and I was I was setting the light on the stage and I just happened to look back up and that's when I realized it, it, it wasn't a person it was a, this tall dark shadow figure and it, it never acknowledged me it was looking across the auditorium at something and I just stared at it I'm trying to process what what am I looking at I'm looking to see if there's light throwing a shadow somewhere and the curtains were closed. There was no way car headlights were creating it. And then all of a sudden it just glided. It didn't walk. I could see it glided across the back of the balcony. And it was solid because there's fire lights on the wall and you couldn't see through it. And then it stopped at the other end and then just whoosh in a second I saw a blur go down the steps. And the whole time, the whole time I'm there... You know, I'm like, what did I just see? You're trying to process this. You know, try, you're trying to explain it like a normal person would. It defies explanation. I, I went home and I told my wife and she looked at me and said, if I were you, I wouldn't tell anybody what you saw. And uh, I, I didn't. I didn't. A year later, um, 
the custodian that worked in that building got moved up to where I'm at. And we got to talk. And I'd never met this guy before. A real nice fellow. And I, I looked at him and I said, have you ever seen anything strange in, in the auditorium? And he got quiet. And he, he just paused and he looked at me and he said, have you? And I said, I asked you first because <laughs> I didn't want to bait the guy, you know. He explained the exact same thing. And someone who rented the facility saw it too. So it wasn't, I didn't imagine it. Other people have seen this thing. And I, I never saw it again. Um, but it was, you know, when you experience something like that, it does change your outlook on a lot of things in, in, in that realm. Uh -huh. Yeah. There was a, when um, Lou Taylor Pucci was on him and Chris Pine, when uh, they were on Carriers, they saw the same ghost there. Apparently, they were filming like at a haunted location, and he was even in mm -hmm. the bathroom. The toilet paper roll moved. They saw um, some people said they saw like just a half a body walking through. Like there was all these experiences where they had filmed that location. So, and uh, yeah, he, like, he thought he was dreaming about the girl or whatever. And then he overheard Chris Pine talking about. It. He's like, I didn't want to say anything, but that's crazy. Like I saw the exact same thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's my only ghost experience. I mean, I don't, it wasn't even a ghost. I don't know what it was. Apparition or something. Apparition. But. Yeah. So, uh, oh, Kyle was saying you saw that. That's very creepy. <laughs> yeah, that was like I don't know, nine years ago. And I, I, yeah, I never saw it again. And I was in that theater late at night. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I was always looking over my shoulder. Uh -huh. Always Dude. looking around to see if it was there. But I never saw it again. Sometimes I hear, like, I'm not a parapsychologist or know too much about it, But, like, I hear stuff like sometimes certain energies when they'll appear. And, um, like, the uh, Amityville, the real Amityville house now, like, hasn't really had any activity in quite some time. And so... Since that family left, I think they were saying. Yeah. yeah. So who knows how that works? Like you said, maybe one day we'll know, or when we die, we'll know everything. And so, I, I think if there's anything there, those spirits are going to want a cut of all the money made from all those Amityville movies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's. Well, it's like it, I met like, I met a contractor who uh, did work in in that house when George Lutz owned it. He was at our university doing uh, construction work, and he would come up and laminate their plans. And he had this thick New York accent. And I asked him where he was from. He said, I'm from Amity, Amityville, New York. I'm like, oh. And he's like, yeah, 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 the house, the house. I said, I said, have you ever been there? He said, hell yeah, I worked there for four months doing reconstruction work. I said, what was the creepiest thing about it? He said, the guy that owned it. He said it's a bunch of shit. He said none of that stuff was true. Yeah, I mean, people were murdered in that house, but but yeah. I mean, there's no denying that. And that whole situation was bizarre. But he said I never saw anything weird there. Yeah, there's been articles and stuff debunking stuff. And the that guy, the killer, um, died not that long ago. I think they were. Oh, did he? I, mean, I didn't know. I knew he went to jail. But you know what? They they. they you know, I've read a lot about it because it is interesting, and they think that maybe he had help. Because if you think about it, there's no way he could have done what he did and not woken somebody up. Completely. But now, ever since, you know, that movie, now we have Amityville Death Toilet, Amityville Christmas Vacation, oh. and on and on mm -hmm. and on. They seem to be those, very popular, almost like shark movies. Andy, if, if, if I'm one of those spirits, I'm going, I want a cut of the royalties <laughs> of that money from those things. Well, I, I, I've i made a few Amityville films, but uh, I always respect, always respectful of, of um, you know, the, the people involved. You have to be real careful because I don't... I, you know, just out of respect for those poor people, you really need to be careful about how the angle you take on some of that. Now, some of the movies use their real names, and maybe they got permission, but, you know, I don't think you're really allowed to do that, especially the, like, the Lutz family that the, the, the movie and the book were written about. You're not allowed to use their names in any of that stuff. 
Um, I think the family that was killed there, you, there's certain limitations that you, you have to abide by to not use names and things like that. And I, I get that. I mean, that's just common courtesy. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's part of American lore, even if, whether it's true or not, you know, I, I'm not here to determine that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's certainly captured America, and, and you know, people still are fascinated with the with the Amityville Horror. Was was it its, its last big film appearance? Was in what one of the Conjuring movies? I think. Um, I want to say, in terms of the big, uh, briefly in I, one of the. I films. think there's only a scene or two that's in it. I don't. I don't know as if it, any of those movies are fully about it. I. I think maybe the third one maybe opens there. I don't. I never saw uh, it. But oh yeah, the third one was about a real life murder trial, where the defense was demonic possession. Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. Didn't work. Didn't work. I guess no. I mean, it didn't work. I think anybody could claim that. You know, basically, it's it's an insanity defense. That's really what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Otto, I wasn't speeding. It was the demons making me do it. I was being controlled. It wasn't me. Um, do you have any uh, future plans to do any more Amityville movies or not as well? Um, no, you know, you never, never say never, like the James Bond movie. Never say never again, but... I've made a few, and they were fun to make. Um, we did Amityville Death House, Amityville Exorcism, Amityville Island, Amityville in Space. I, I don't. I might be forgetting one, but I don't think so. I mean, well, I that, that might be it. That's one thing when you when you look up the Amity films, you get you know I'm just gonna get a few films, and next thing you know, you get about you know three pages worth of titles. You think, okay, they're all, okay, after Amityville, I had said something about, oh, Amityville Death Toy, and I go, what next? Amityville Vibrator, and someone goes, you know they did that. Yeah, like, that's like, are, you, are you kidding me? Really? Like, my favorite is part two. I think Amityville, Amityville 2 is a great movie. That's just a great movie. I like it better than the original. I think the original movie came out at the right time and writing right off the book but when you watch that movie it, it really plays like a made for tv film with just a little bit more sex and violence uh amityville 2 goes for it you know they they didn't pull back on anything that was the prequel was it one of the yeah yeah Real, it's a yeah. well-made well-made film and scary it really is a scary movie Mm -hmm. That's something about. I think the reason why I stay away from some supernatural movies because some of them do get pretty scary and creepy. I stay away from the Conjuring series for the longest time until I finally saw the third one. I'm just like, ah. When they possess, whenever the person's possessed, they're moving. You get this eerie sounds of bones cracking and popping. That was very uh, unsettling. Like, yeah, different know. different things scare different people. Um, when I was a kid, you know, the original Night of the Living Dead was, was horrifying. And then I, I saw a movie on HBO called It's Alive about the killer baby. That movie, I was so scared, I couldn't get out of my chair. I watched the whole thing because I was afraid to move. You know, you look at it today and it's kind of corny, but it struck a chord with me as a, as a 10 or 11 year old that you know, there's something about it that just frightened me, frightened me very badly. I think it was uh, Texas Chainsaw is the only, the original is the only movie, horror movie to ever really scare me. Because I remember being a little kid and running out of the room crying. And yeah, I, I, you know, that was, I was too young to go see. I saw it on video and I have to admit I was a bit underwhelmed by it. Technically, it's a very well-made film. Very well made, and I could see why it terrified people. But I didn't. I think its reputation is bigger than the film. I just, yeah, you know, it's a classic. You can't take that away from it. But I'm not a super fan of that film. I think it gets a, uh, it gets annoying. It's annoying after a while. 
I haven't heard people get into this debate in a while, but there was a debate about the scene where she gets shoved on the hook for a long time, whether or not we saw it going in. But it's like, no, if you no. look at it, he, it cuts real it's quick. Out of frame. Different angle. Like, it's yeah, like, it's out of frame. Boom. But people have been like, for a long time, like, you see it going in, and when you watch the scene, no, no. Yeah, it's just, it's yeah. Quick. I mean, Toby it's Hooper, quick. Toby Hooper was really good at that. He. He knew what to show and what not to show, but he knew how to bait you beforehand so you imagined you saw something. Most people say, oh, that movie's bloody and gory, and I'm like, you didn't see it then because there's no blood. The only blood in that movie is where Leatherface cuts his own leg when he fall, when he trips and falls and the chainsaw falls on. Yeah, That's the most blood there is in that movie, but people imagine they see it, and uh, you know it builds up his legendary status. Yeah, Toby Hooper knew what he was doing. The guy was a good director, I think, when he when he cared. Um, he made some really good movies. Oh, he, he made he some got pretty canned, bad ones, yeah. too. He got, he got canned in films when they thought they were going to get, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Oh, we're going to get like that. Boy, he went a different direction. I heard they went too happy. Yeah, they were, they were not happy when they watched the movie. They I were not happy fun, at it's all. It's a fun movie to watch. It is. It's yeah, it's yeah. different. I I think Life Force is a fantastic movie. Oh yeah. Where else I think it's his best movie, film. Yeah. Where else can you get a movie where you have Patrick Stewart kissing another guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I, as good as Texas Chainsaw Massacre is, his follow up film, I can't I can't get through it. I just don't like it. Eaten Alive, or it has a million different titles. But. Oh, that's the um. The hotel, whatever, got an alligator or whatever in it. Yeah, yeah. But then he knocks it out of the park again with Salem's Lot and Poltergeist. So, you know, the guy, the, the guy, the guy knew what he was doing. So, um, is there any film that does or has terrified you? Recently? Or in general in life or growing up or and recently. Uh, recently, no, because you know the, the 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 gigs up. I you know I know what it's all about. Um, exactly. Yeah. As a kid, as a kid, yeah, uh, it's alive. Night of the Living Dead. There was a movie called The Other, um, uh, John Ritter's first movie about these twins, and uh, that that scared me. That's a weird little creepy movie, and being a twin, it was even creepier. But the plot is is one of them's dead, but you don't know it till the end of the movie, and they're talking to each other, and and people start these kids are playing in a playing in a hay barn, and the one twin or his ghost puts a pitchfork in the hay, and the kid jumps on it, and huh. and uh, you know John Ritter and his wife in the movie have a baby, and it disappears, and they find it in a pickle jar. It's just it's really disturbing. Well made movie, but. I saw it as a kid, and I, I just I won't watch it again. I would never watch that movie again. It really left a mark on me. So I guess uh, the movie Twins with Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't terrifying. <laughs> no, no, no that that didn't bother me. I there, was there, was just garbage? <laughs> yeah. there, there was just something. If you ever get a chance to watch the movie, watch it. It's funny because. It's based on a book written by the guy who was the star of I Married a Monster from Outer Space, Tom Tryon. He was an actor in Hollywood when he started writing books. And that was one of the books that he wrote. It's just it's a really good movie. And it takes place in like rural Kansas or one of those wheat, wheat field Bible Belt places in like 1905. So it's already kind of a, you know, stagnated backwards sort of of um, plot and living and that, that makes that just makes the struggle worse you know it's just it's really good really really good movie uh -huh. um as we know the polonia pals over the years um i know some of them i've talked to how they met you and everything um, a lot of locals or film festivals um, but is there anyone that you've wanted to work with that you've tried to reach out to or anyone you're interested in working with in the future? Oh, you know, 
I I love working with 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 anybody and everybody. I mean, I'm a people person. You kind of have to be to be a director, and and uh, you know, some <laughs> some directors aren't people persons, and and it shows. You know, that's those are the sets where there's always conflict. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I've I've worked with so many great people. I mean, I'd be here all night telling you all the people I've worked with that were just fantastic and, 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 and they keep coming back. So that says something. Of course. Um, and of course, like Tim, yeah. Hatch, Tim Hatch and Kyle and you know, like all of them. Yeah. I mean, everybody that's been in, in one of our films from, from early time, early days up until now, they, they, they were great people. They brought something to the film that maybe we couldn't have given them as, a, you know, as our inexperience early on would have been, um, you know, I've made enough movies and worked with enough people. I do understand actors a lot better and, and the process and what actors need from a director, what they need not from a director. Um, and, and just the dynamics of, of, of working with people. You know, I, I worked in service oriented, a job at the university. So I dealt with people day in and day out. A lot of times it was problem solving, but, but you learn how to deal with people. You, you, you learn how to take the, the strengths of people and boost them up. And if they're weak in an area, you, you learn to circumvent that and, and still boost them up. Um, you know, as a director, you wear a lot of hats. You're a problem solver, you're a diplomat, you're a psychologist. You're a friend. Sometimes you got to be tough with people. So there's all these, it's, you know, making a movie isn't just technical. There's a lot of, of a human element involved. And, you know, when you understand people and you let people ha have a say in what you're doing, let them invest in, in the production, uh, it's such a great process because... You, you know, directors that want everything their way, you know, my way, this way, I don't want you to deviate from this, you know, you're still going to get a movie made, but when you, when you let the people that you bring on board have a say, you know, oh, I have an idea, what if we did this, you know, you always listen, you, you want to listen, because sometimes people come up with great ideas. Now, you may not use them. You may have to kindly say, you know, that's a great idea, but we just don't have time for that. Or I don't think that fits the character. But you, you got to let you got to let the people that are involved be involved. They're not just there to stand there and say your lines. They're committing themselves to it. And you want them to invest in it and 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 feel free to collaborate, share ideas, you know, voice their opinion if they have one. You know, on my sets, we have relatively few problems. You know, I can't honestly think of one film I worked on where we had any major conflicts. Because you just, you treat people like people. And and they, they get that. They sense that. And they feel like they're a part of it. And they want to be a part of it. And you kind of have to cultivate that on the set early on. Um, and things go smoothly. Um, I've worked with lots of different people with lots of different experience with lots of different backgrounds um, and it's been a great experience I, I can't I really would be hard pressed to think back to working with a difficult person or having a real challenge with somebody on set because I honestly haven't mm -hmm. And um, I don't know from other movies that you worked on, but my experience when I was working on the stocking also, um, like I had the opportunity when uh, the party scene, I'll just say, I, I don't want to say what, because I don't want to spoil it, but I came up with like a couple of funny insults that were thrown into the movie when the party girls were coming in. So, I mean, that's fun. And, you know, that you can let people maybe throw in a little something to their character on set as well. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Full metal jacket. That scene with Ali was improv. Those lines, mm -hmm. which also made me an Ali fan. Um, from the, you know when you're making a movie, from the writing, you know, coming up with the concept to you know the final editing. But how long does it take? Um, 
couple weeks, roughly a month, if I'm going at a good clip. I mean, some years, I, I can make between 5 and 10 or 11 movies in a year, um, depending on, you know, what's going on in my life at the time. But um, early on, it, it, it because you were struggling through the process and you're, you'd shoot on weekends and that, that just doesn't work too well. Um, because what happens is people, they get busy and, um, you know, they have lives too and, and things come up. So I like to shoot a movie over the course of four or five days because you get all the people together, you're there, you can get it shot. Occasionally you have to come back and reshoot stuff, but Stretching a movie out for a year or two, I mean, that's a that's asking a lot um, of somebody, and that's a big commitment. The longest film I ever shot was The House That Screamed. We shot that on 16 millimeter, and it took us from Labor Day weekend till the weekend before Christmas to finish shooting it because we could only shoot Saturday and Sundays because our DP worked just like we did, and uh, the lead actor lived in Wilkesbury, Bob Dennis, but he, he was there every weekend. And and it just took so much time to shoot in 16. You know, if you shot indoors with the, with the, with the film stock we were using, you had to put orange gels on the windows so the color balance was right. And it just, everything took forever. And um, it was a long, that movie took a year. That movie took a year, literally, from shooting to, to uh, finding a distributor. Because that was the first movie we cut on a non-linear editing system, too. Because, you know, we shot on negative Kodak. I can't remember what the stock was. But it was a really fine grain, really beautiful-looking stock. And we had it all trans... We could only afford to transfer the first roll to make sure the camera was fine. It was... And uh, we, we transferred it to videotape. And, and the rest of the time, we shot without seeing what it was going to look like when it came back. And we, we literally got the footage back Christmas Eve of that year. And um, they, sent us, uh, they sent us the footage that was a one-light transfer to three-quarter-inch tape. And they sent us a VHS tape, so we popped in the VHS tape and watched the whole thing with our fingers crossed, and it all looked beautiful. So, but yeah, again, that's that's not the normal situation now. Now, you know, I, I could from from concept of finishing a movie about a month's time. Um. Let's see, uh, Patrick, have Cheetah will be, uh, he came in a little late, so he didn't hear the sad news about the Kia dying, but uh, he was wondering, did it have a name? It had a couple names. Uh, my wife called it Booger because she hated the color. Um, I called it, I called it the Green Goblin. A couple people had other derogatory names for it, but I didn't care. <laughs> It was paid for. I don't care what anyone thinks of the color of the car. Yeah. So rest in peace. That's still disturbing. That's still sad. But it's time has come. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. And um, Kyle was also saying how he had fun on the stocking with us. And uh, he, he's also excited to see it. So, yeah, we're all excited to see that. Uh, yeah. I, I, I uh, just looked at it today because I had to go in and tweak some things. And. It's it's going to be a great film. It really is. It's everybody. Ever again. It's you know I've said this before, but everybody involved in that movie, from from our cast to the crew to the caterer to the locations. I mean, we had a guy let us use his locations for free. Mm -hmm. Everyone did a fabulous job, and it shows. You can see it on the screen. You really can tell that we had a good time making that film. Uh, what, are your thoughts, what are your thoughts on uh, physical media versus digital media since we're seeing people move away from physical media? Um, you know, I'm kind of an old-fashioned guy, so 
I mean, if, if you could see around my room, I'm surrounded by shelves full of DVDs and Blu-ray. So I'm still a physical media guy. I like to still read books. I like the book in my hand. I mean, digital is the way of the future. You can't deny it. And I'm slow to embrace it, but I assume someday I'll have to. I'll have a hard drive full of a thousand movies, I guess. I don't really like it. Um, you know, streaming in general is, is, again, it's just a variation on the home video rental market. It's just a new way to, it's a new platform to watch movies and distribute them. So that's a good thing. But I'm still the kind of guy that likes physical media. You know, I stream movies all the time and nothing pisses me off more than it pausing because, you know, my wife's upstairs doing work on her computer for work or the neighbors, you know, using it to talk to their grandkids out in Nebraska or something. You know, that annoys me. That doesn't happen with a DVD. No. no. Or I, actually, yeah, yeah. I had a guy freak out one time. I was reading a book somewhere and he freaked out. Because he had never, he hadn't seen one somebody have an actual book in his hands in a while. So he starts freaking out like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Someone still does it. What reads? <laughs> yes, they do <laughs> exist. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Like, I don't have Kindle or any of that because I I look at a computer all day and it, it hurts my eyes to read. So I still like to read a book. Um. But a day will come in my lifetime that, you know, you just have to accept what it what is is and move move on and embrace it. So, you know, I hope, you know, all these movies I own, you know, maybe they'll be collector's items in 50 years and be worth $1,000 a piece or something. I don't know because they won't make DVD players. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It's hard to tell what the future holds, but you, you sort of, you know, I'm from a gener, you know, we're generations apart. At least I think we are. You know, kids today, it's you know, streaming is just a, it's a way of life. For me, it's something new, and I'm not really that cool with it. But I, I'm, I'm warming up to it, and I know I'll have to accept it. And it's just the way it is. I've noticed was it like Walmart, the amount of movies they have, DVDs and Blu-ray are going down, but not mm -hmm. the amount of vinyl. Like, yeah, yeah. Coming back. yeah, yeah. So what's old is new again. It's it's you know whoever would have thought they'd be pressing records again. I never figured they'd do that. But all this stuff is you know it, it's it's current and then it fades away and then it's nostalgic and then it comes back. So I don't know. Maybe my kids' kids will get some use out of this stuff or sell it. I don't know. Yeah, it's what's sad is that it also we lost a lot of video stores. Yeah, and this the video stores were so much fun. Going yeah, in. we got one in my hometown, and someone found out about it because I showed a picture of it, and they called me a liar. Said you, that's fake. You had to Photoshop that. It's like, no, those, those still out there. Just gotta look <laughs> around. Those still out there. And, well, there is. I forget where the location is, but there's still one blockbuster left. Uh, that is a few hours south of me. Ah, okay. And one of these days, I got to get off my butt and just go down. In fact, uh, who was it? Uh, James Ralph, Angry Video Game Nerd. I think it was them. They went down there, and they used the old card to actually rent from there. And I don't think I have in, my old card. They stayed unfortunately. in the parking lot and watched the movie and then returned it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Kyle says he loves physical media. It's the way to go. I mean, if internet goes down, he's got your movies to watch. So, and, and here's another thing about you know Kindles and all this stuff. These digital copies of books, those lose power. <laughs> A book doesn't. Yep. So, who knows what the future holds there? Uh, like when um, it goes to digital, maybe Blu-rays will make it come back just like vinyl. <laughs> I don't think I'll be alive to see that, though. Yeah, you yeah. might be, Stephen, but not me. <laughs> Maybe I'll be uh, eighty. I'll be eighty or ninety. <gasps> Blu-rays are coming back! Yay! <laughs> hey, hey, we got vinyl back. I'm waiting for A tracks and Beta Max to come back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> beta Beta was the superior format to VHS, but the reason JVC, who who owned them both. 
they dumped beta because it was cheaper to make a VHS cassette shell than it was to make a beta shell. Like, That's I why got, beta disappeared. Yeah, I got two betas. I got The Fog, the original, and a movie called Mutant. Mm, that sounds familiar. About a small Is that the town. one with Wings Hauser? Is that the one with so. Wings Hauser? Yeah, I guess it's on a small town and people are like turning into creatures and yeah. people. Yeah, that's a shitty movie. That's a shitty it's, movie. It was, they had a, I found it on eBay, and it's like, you can get The Fog for this sort of price, and it comes with a bonus, The Mutant. And it was like the best deal for The Fog, so like, okay, I'm getting that. <laughs> it's a terrible movie. I hate that movie. Not The Fog, Mutant. It was called something else when I saw it on HBO. It had a different title. It was it's such a disappointing film. movie. It's the one film that really, if you watched growing up, that really you found a disappointment. Really, really, can't, you can't stand. Um, well, mutant is one of them. Um, ah, you know that's a good question. I'd have to think on that. I, I like a lot of stuff. I rarely hate a movie. I mean, every movie has something good about it. But um, yeah, mutant is one that I thought was a huge, huge, huge disappointment. Um. Yeah, you know, something will come. I'll, I'll mention it if it comes to me. But I'm yeah, sure there I, are. I'm, I'm I sure always there's... thought the the original Carnival of Souls. The one way to keep me from doing anything bad or commit a crime, just play that movie for me, and I, I'll be a perfect angel. I cannot stand. We had to watch that in school in high school, and <laughs> See, I love that over, movie. I, when the class would get over, I'd be banging on the door, "Let me out! Let me out!" We could watch movies in high school, but we had to do a report on them. So, but then that got ruined because someone brought in showgirls and they said no more. <laughs> we watched the song remains the same. I thought, oh, I can get out of school work. I'll just watch this movie, get done, go write us a report. Son of a. I I remember in high school we um we before Christmas break, they'd always show a movie, and it was sixth grade, and, you know, they'd always show crap like, you know, the amazing Dobermans and family stuff, and for one year, for some reason, I don't know why, they showed Vault of Horror, and I remember, like, I, I loved it, but there were kids crying, because, like, people were getting their heads run over by trucks, and their hands cut off in paper cutters, and I thought it was—I thought it was just a hoot. But someone got in big trouble showing that movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't know how they got there. Um, Kyle was wondering: Do you remember a movie called *The Rejuvenator*? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It was called *The Rejuvenatrix*. It had two different titles. Yeah, that's oh. the one thing about some movies, like. Um... What's the Living Dead in Manchester Morgue? It's got yeah. how many titles? Got so like, like six or seven. Yeah. I, there's one movie, I forget what the movie was, that's supposed, supposedly, it's a, I think it's a horror movie that set the record or whatever for most titles. I just can't remember what it was. Yeah. I have to look that like, up. Um, like <laughs> I feel like back Bay of Blood, I still think Twitch of the Death Nerve is a better title than Bay of Blood. Yeah. And all the deaths from all the deaths from Friday the Thirteenth are copied from that movie. But the, the, the scene of Friday the Thirteenth when the two are having sex and he kills them, it's better in, in, in Bay of Blood because you watch it, they're dead. The guy's still moving. Did you ever like see a, the uncut footage from Friday the Thirteenth Part Two? Uh, not yet. I, I think that's on it's, my it's, it's on YouTube. You can watch it. It's it's. Uh, I mean, they cut out a lot. They cut out quite a bit in that film, but those are great, great effects. Those are great effects. Yeah, I, I got to check, but I think it's on the Screen Factory. When they released it on Screen Factory, I think they had the uncut on there. Yeah, I, I still got to get the still book from that, which I can't find Find all the other ones. It's like uh, My Bloody Valentine. I had no idea I was watching the edited one. Simpson one, yeah, whatever. that got Years. butchered. That that got butchered too. I mean, Paramount released both those films, and they they cut them themselves because they knew that the MPA was going to go berserk on them. Yeah, and um, yeah. my bloody yeah. Valentine, 
they chop three yeah. times as much out of that as they did Friday the 13th part two. They they released the still book for it, which has got a super awesome <coughs> like design for the case, which has both. And I'm like, oh, I need to watch this. I hate when they cut stuff to like that. It's like just leave it or just release it both together or don't cut that out. We want to see the full movie. Um Darkness. I don't know. Um, Leaf Jonkers Darkness. Have you seen that? Yeah. Shot on Super 8. Hmm. It's a good movie. I think it's his only movie, but it's a really good movie. Really gory. Really over-the-top gore. Mm-hmm. One who uh, does some interesting gore is some of the stuff they got coming out of Japan. Mm-hmm. Found that when I was watching uh, Tokyo Gore Police and Machine Guard. <laughs> but it was Tokyo Gore Police that just had me going. Did, did she turn herself into a chair so somebody can sit on her? Yeah, the Japanese come up with some crazy stuff. Like, I don't know. But they gave us Ultraman and Godzilla, so we'll forgive them. <laughs> Godzilla. I love how in the old Godzilla is like when their mouth moves and they're speaking English, but then it's like, Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, I still, there is, when you want to talk about dubbing, was it? So I was talking about this, somebody was Godzilla versus Gigan, I think. In Japan, they gave Godzilla word bubbles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he talks. He talks in the American version. He's got those voices. Out of my ear! Out of my ear! He sounds uh, like Herb Bielichez from Fantasy Island. I cannot... I, my, every time I see that movie, I cannot help but laugh when they speak. Because that's just... Those voices they're doing... Over here, over here. <laughs> they should have a toy Godzilla toy with that. That'd be funny. <laughs> Saying that, what? That's funnier than the time he flew. In and Godzilla man. versus the Smog Monster. Yeah, it's funny. I saw that movie on TV, and a week later, it was playing at a matinee, and I went and saw it again. Well, it yeah. literally was on television. And then it played at the theater the week later. Our mother well, never would have taken us if she knew we saw it on TV. Well, the <laughs> upcoming new one, Godzilla minus zero or one or whatever. Zero. It's, mm-hmm. It was at least in Japan in November and theaters here in December. So like, what should, I wonder who's releasing it. Who's releasing it, though? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I know that You know, I'm more interested in the fact that this takes place in the 40s. Yeah, I bet you there's two Godzillas. I bet you there's two Godzillas in this. Yeah, because I'm just I'm, I'm intrigued by that that idea. Yeah, yeah, I think the trailer looks fabulous. I mean that that last live action one they did, Shin, I loved. I liked it when they when they were cutting like when they were like all okay, give the idea of chaotic to me like when they're talking the camera. Would quit would cut back and forth between the people like real fast, like mm-hmm. it's chaos, and I like that. Yeah, the only the only American giant monster, well, not American, the only non-Japanese monster movie that gives you a real sense of of chaos and disaster is Gorgo. When he's when he's marching through London looking for his baby, that you you really. You really get the sense that that's what it would be like if that happened. That's a great movie. That's a great movie. What year was that? 1960. Yeah, I know I've seen it. Did they remake that? Or am I wrong? No. No, they they probably made a movie with the same plot, but they've never remade Gorgo. Yeah, it's been forever since I've watched any of the Godzillas. I need to like go back and watch them. Well, they did those CGI ones, which were, they were okay. <laughs> the one with they, Matthew Broadway, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was... Uh, hey, that know. gave us an interesting cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> and it also gave us the line of, with the play, you know, you know, Jaws, we need a bigger boat. Oh, you need a bigger boat, so what do we get? We're going to need bigger guns. Yep. <laughs> we know what line they stole that from. <laughs> So um, what's something that um, we might not know about you, Mark, like either uh, interests or hobbies, talents, anything that you'd share that we may not know? Or what you like to do in your well, spare time? I, well, I don't really have a whole lot of spare time. But, um, 
I love to boat. I, I, I love the ocean. I like being on water. I really enjoy, you know, being at lakes, going to the ocean. Um, as a kid, as a kid, I always loved that. And, and I, you know, we bought a boat. It's in a couple of our movies. And I try to go to the ocean every year. Um, yeah, that's probably something most people don't know. I mean, I spend my, my whole time, you know, wrapped up in, in, you know, my, my job, I'm, you know, I'm a family man. I have a, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a grandfather. So that, you know, you have those responsibilities as well. You know, people think, oh, all the guy does is make movies. That That's true, but I'm a human being too. I, I, you know, have have uh, life, normal yeah. interests as well. I have a, I have a life sort of, um, yeah. but, but, you know, I, I can't complain. I can't complain. You know, if the people always say, if you could go back and change anything, would you? And the answer is no, absolutely not. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. And I have no regrets, you know, and that's a good place to be. Let's see what else we got. Uh, any other questions that go? We've been going an hour and a half. Well, I was going to say uh, thank you. You gave, you know, we've had film, we interviewed other filmmakers, but you gave us, I think, an interesting insight. Mm -hmm. You know, much For more sure. than what they did. I'm not trying to knock them, but it was definitely an interesting insight uh, into the you know the process of doing the films. I think that was you know, like I said, it was educational. Mm -hmm. I like that. It was pretty cool. Good, uh, good, yeah. It's it's fun to share stories about the set and filmmaking and maybe someday I'll write a book, how to make a movie for nothing. Well, here's one for you. If, if uh, someone was interested in, in, you know, getting to know your films, what would be the one film you say they could start off with of yours? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, God, <laughs> that's a good question. That really is. Um, I think I would start somewhere in the middle because if you start at the beginning, you know, some of them are crude and technically not there. The, the passion's there. It's in every movie we've ever made. But I think I would probably maybe start with something more recent and work my way backwards. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. You, you get, like, I'm looking up here. I have a box set of Al Adamson, Andy Milligan, Bill Rabane. And uh, Ray Dennis Steckler, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's so cool to watch these because you, you, you know, you get a sense of that. Not only the filmmaker, but the person. You know, you get to know the person behind it all. And and some of these guys, granted, you know, didn't make as many movies as I did. I hope someday after I'm gone, they do a giant box set of my films. But you literally. In our films and extras on our films, you can see literally everything we've ever created if you were the kind of person that wanted to do that. And I think that's cool that these box sets come out because you really get to see not only the filmmaker's journey, but their legacy as well. Because that's something you leave behind. You're not, you're not really in control of your legacy. That's something that once you're dead and gone other people rake up the leaves and put it in a pile for you. And, and, you know, it's just neat to see the filmmakers, their first movie, their last movie, what they did in between, you know, their story, you know, because these people are they're artists and they, they, despite what you may think about their films, they were passionate about what they did and they did it their whole life. And often without fame and most of the time without fortune, but they did it. And that, that was their passion. And, and, you know, I think that's the most important thing that you can leave somebody with is you may watch an Andy Milligan movie and hate it. You may watch an Al Adamson movie and hate it, Bill Corbett movie, but you can't deny the passion these people put into everything they did. And they may not have seen it and other people may not have seen it at the time, but at the end of the day, you get to take a look at this this person under a microscope and see what they've done. And uh, I just I think that's fascinating. It, it really is. You learn so much about the person, 
the circumstances in which they did things. It, and it gives you a whole new insight as to, you know, these films you may have dismissed initially, but when you find out the real story behind it and how it got made, it really gives you respect for, for a lot of these people, you know. Not everyone's Steven Spielberg or George Lucas, but the world doesn't need a hundred George Lucases and Steven Spielbergs. The world does need an Andy Milligan occasionally and a Ray Dennis Steckler and Mark Polonia and, and uh, you know, other filmmakers because they're, they're outside the Hollywood system. They're underfunded, but they make up for it in their desire and passion. And they're the true auteurs of what they do. They're not, they don't have a list of things they have to accommodate to get the movie made. They can share they can share their vision their way. And and I think that's what sets those guys apart from Hollywood contemporaries. And I'm sure all those guys, and even me at one time, had dreams of being a big Hollywood director. But not anymore. I want to be me. I, I, wanna, I want my vision to be there. What, what's in my heart and my imagination. And that's not something you're going to get from, from a homogenized, Hundred and fifty million dollar movie, so mm -hmm. definitely. Um, any uh, future plans for any conventions or anything, or any place we might be able to come by and meet you? You know, <laughs> I uh, I I don't really do a lot of conventions. I don't know. I guess I don't get invited to them. You know, maybe someday when I retire as a guest, I do go to conventions. But um, recently. I, they had a screening of uh, Splatter Farm at the Nighthawk Cinema in Brooklyn, and I went to that uh, with a little trepidation. You know, it's a, one of our first films. It's technically not that great, but I have to say it was such a great experience. To, the, the print looked really good. The audio was better than I The movie was better than I thought. But when you're watching that up there on a big screen with all these people and they're laughing at all the right moments and groaning at all the right moments, it it was the first time I saw that movie as a movie rather than it's a, it's a film I made as a filmmaker because I experienced it with an audience. And it, it you know, for a bunch of 17-year-olds old, right out of high school, I thought we did a damn fine job. And and watching it on that big screen, I could I could see the seeds of what we created afterwards and what came after it. It was just a it was just a really neat experience. And the the, the people that watched it, they asked great questions afterwards. And they had a bar there right next to the theater, and I signed autographs for for an hour got my picture taken with all these people. It was, it was, it was a neat experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, anything else, Echo? Um, no, it's again, um, thank you. This is very insightful. And hearing your insights, I, wow, it's, hmm. I think of, you know, I'm, you, I was already becoming a fan. Now I'm definitely more of a fan after, you know, after hearing all this and yeah, yeah getting that's perspective. A, so, um, well, any, that's, I love the commentary tracks on our movies because they're, they're just full of in, insightful stuff, you know? One, it's, of the uh, best, one of the best commentary tracks, it's actually a text commentary tracks, and I've told people about this before, Return of the Living Dead, the dead speak text-based commentary, where it's funny as can be, so like you get the dog, ouch, ouch, oh, oh, sorry, yelp, yelp, yelp. <laughs> You get the zombie, they, they put the axe in the head, they cut the neck off, they talk about acid and crematory and cremated, and you hear all of a sudden you see acid cremation. What is wrong with you guys? <laughs> the best way to watch the film is to sit there and read that, and you'll be like just falling. Like, it's so funny to hear them, the zombies, you know, the comment, uh, read the commentary. Yeah, yeah. Well, commentaries are great because it gives, uh, it gives you insight into the movie, and then you can talk about different parts of it and, yeah. and elaborate um, as much as you can in 90 minutes. I, you know, I have diarrhea of the mouth a lot, so I, I barely get through a fraction of what I'd like to talk about, but so be it. Yeah. Um, is there any um, 
social media or sites or anything upcoming or anything you want us to know about or promote out there besides the stocking, of course, coming out, anything else? Uh, I know Jurassic Just, yeah. Shark is on Amazon now. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a couple things coming out. I can't really mention here, but, you know, we, we pretty much have a movie come out every other month or sometimes a couple times, uh, uh, you know, several months in a row. Um, cause we keep making them. Um, but you know, you could check out Polonia brothers entertainment at my Facebook page for, for as much up to date as I do, I should be better about Facebook, but, um, you know, I'm an old timer. So social media is not something I embrace as much as I probably should, but, um, just Google my name. You'll find all kinds of interesting insights into what people think about our films and it's good and bad and, and that's fine you know you're not always going to make something everyone likes and and uh you know you, you have your fans and you have your detractors and that's that's the way it's going to be in life no matter what you do so and just just keep doing and doing what you do and people who are negative i mean that's their own you know prerogative whatever you know, just do what you do and there are those who appreciate what you do very much and want you to keep doing what you're doing and so um let's see what else the movies of course it's always great to get the physical copies but if you search mark Polony on tubi there's like 80 wow there's like tons of movies a lot, on a lot of uh, shark movies <laughs> and a lot of shark movies i <laughs> found that out when i did shark month on my channel and i'm looking through the Russell Eddie, mark Polonia, mark Polonia, mark Polonia, mark Polonia. Holy moly! How many shark movies did he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I don't. I, I I don't think I've ever counted, but I, at least eight or nine. Yeah. And with Walter well, with Tubi, sometimes they don't put them in English, so you could. Yeah, yeah. Like, a couple of them they don't have in English. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. like, what he he made another shark movie. Well, apparently, uh, I've seen uh, Jeff post stuff of like uh, Japan. They like all the shark stuff and Sharkenstein and all that. Uh, so pretty much worldwide, there. Yeah, I, our our movies our movies are all over the world. They really are in Japan, Germany, Italy, France. Uh, you know, illegally in Russia, like almost every movie that's released. Um, Mexico, England. Yeah, I've, I've got posters and clip art from a lot of my films from other countries. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, so reach pretty much everywhere and inspire people around the world to, you know, pick up a camera or do their own script, whatever they want to do. So, um, yeah, that's, see, that's, a, that's a cool thing. People say, you know, people say, well, what do you think when you read a review that says, you know, I could make a better movie with my grandmother's iPhone. And I'm like, you know, here's the thing, you know, if you're inspiring someone to do something, there, there's nothing better. Whether they say, God, I love your movies, I'm going to try that, or they say, you know, your movies are, are crap, I could do better, and they go and make their own movie. You've inspired them to do something. There's nothing negative about that. Mm -hmm. so. And, yeah. Any other messages for us? I mean, I, I enjoy, I mean, you're welcome to say as long as you want. I'm just uh, pretty much, I think, ask the same thing. I mean, you've done so much. I could talk forever and ask, and, you know, we could go into detail into so much. Um, but, you know, you're always welcome back. And um, probably once the stocking comes out, I was thinking about, you know, doing like a group uh, show, you know, so that might be fun to do, work something out in the future. Um, That'd be great. That, that would be great. So... All right. Uh, yeah. Next week we got uh, Steve Rimpici coming on. Uh, so tune in for that. And if you just want to stick around just for a minute, Mark, I'll go ahead and end it. And uh, thanks to Kyle, Jamie, uh, Alucard, everybody who was in here, Hobbs. Uh, thanks for tuning in and everyone who's watching the replay. Have a good night.